Please open your Bibles and join me for today's scripture. The first scripture reading is from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 32 and 33. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 32 and 33. Therefore you shall be careful to do as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. Second scripture comes from Psalms, chapter 128, verse 1. Psalms 128, verse 1. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. And our third scripture comes from John chapter 15, verse 7 through 10. John chapter 15, 7 through 10. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Amen. Amen. Last time I was with you, we were in Mark chapter 10. We're still there. Last time we looked at Jesus, and he was in the midst of his final week of ministry here on earth. He declared that childlike faith is required to enter the kingdom of God. He revealed we need a serious commitment to obtain eternal life. And then he shared that we should concentrate on the rewards of following him. That last idea begs the question, how does one go about following Jesus? The remainder of Mark chapter 10 answers that question. Turn to Mark chapter 10, look at verse 32. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. As they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Jesus and his disciples are traveling to Jerusalem. Your verse says they're going up to Jerusalem. In our minds, that means they're traveling north. Not true. They're actually traveling southwest, technically. Going up is a reference to the fact that Jerusalem is on Mount Moriah. So it's up in elevation. But it's interesting to note that although the Gospel of John records lots of trips that Jesus takes to Jerusalem... The Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, only record one trip, this trip, this specific trip that Jesus is taking to Jerusalem, his final trip, the one in which Jesus knowingly, willingly, and purposefully travels to Jerusalem so that he could be killed. Look at Luke chapter 9. Verse 51. This final trip is kind of important. I want you to be in Luke chapter 9, land in verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for Jesus to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus is our example, and he's showing here in this final trip to Jerusalem that if we are going to follow him, we have to be ready to make sacrifices. Spirit of Prophecy, page 486, puts it this way. 
To the heart of Christ, it was a bitter task to make his way to Jerusalem against the fears, disappointment, and unbelief of his beloved disciples. It was hard to lead them forward to the anguish and despair that awaited them at Jerusalem. And Satan was on hand to press his temptations upon the Son of Man. The foe who in the wilderness had confronted Christ assailed him now with fierce and subtle temptations. Had Jesus yielded for a moment, had he changed his course in the least particular way to save himself, Satan would have triumphed and the world would have been lost. If you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to follow his example. We have to be ready to make sacrifices. On the way, Jesus tells his disciples why he's going. Mark chapter 10, verses 33 and 34. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem... And the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, scourge him, sorry, and spit on him and kill him. And on the third day he will rise again. Jesus is telling his disciples again about his coming suffering. The Son of Man is a Masonic title describing who is going to be handed over to the chief priests, a term that describes the temple officers, which include the high priest and the captain of the guards. And this group also includes the scribes. We would call them lawyers or the academics of the word. And this group of people is going to condemn Jesus to death and hand him over to the Romans for execution. This group will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and finally kill him. The good news is that on the third day, he will arise. Wouldn't it be easier for Jesus to figure out another way? None of those things that are going to happen to him seem pleasant in my mind. And yet, he willingly paid the price for our salvation. He endured all that unpleasantness. He made all those sacrifices. And this telling of his disciples, in fact, is the third time he's explained it to them. I'm glad other people are slow at learning. He told it to them in Mark 8.31, Mark 9.31. And the reason he has to tell them 30 times about what's going to happen and why is because the Jews had an expectation of what's going to happen when the Messiah came. Of course, that expectation was wrong. And so he had to explain over and over again. Please remember the setting of where where we're at in Mark. Jesus has, just, Jesus has just predicted his horrible death, the pain he's going to suffer, the suffering he has to endure, all because he chooses to make a sacrifice for us. Now look with me at Mark chapter 10, verse 35 through 37. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Talk about being kind of egocentric. Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right, one on your left, in your glory. Now picture what's going on here. These guys have been with Jesus for over three years. For the third time, he tries to explain to them what he's going to endure not much longer in the future. Their response is, yeah, that's real nice, but here's what we want. Really? I mean, I've been egotistical in my life, but I don't think I've stooped to this low. Their leader... The man who has given them undivided attention for three years tells them he's going to die a death that is indescribably painful. And their answer is, yeah, but what else can you do for us? Really? 
Not much concern for the sympathy that awaits our Savior. These brothers desire the positions of great honor in the coming Masonic kingdom. Person on the right is number one, if you understand power positions, gets the highest honor, and the one on the left gets second place. In light of what they just heard, they have the audacity to say, yeah, but what are you going to do for us now? With grace, Jesus disregards their social misstep and answers them. Verse 38, you do not know what you ask. Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I will be baptized with? This word baptism, don't be confused about what happens in the tank behind me. This is like being engrossed with suffering you can't imagine. That's what he's talking about. James and John arrogantly say, sure, we can handle that. If they only knew. Then Jesus makes a pretty profound observation. I'm in verse 39. Jesus says in the second half, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. Whoa. These two socially inept guys who are misreading the environment, who don't understand what Jesus is describing and don't understand what's ahead of them, say, yeah, we can handle that, no problem. And Jesus says, yeah, you will. Now, just as an aside, find Acts chapter 12. This is a tangent and has nothing to do with the sermon, but I don't want to preach a short sermon, so I stick these things in to fill up time. I want you to be in Acts chapter 12. Look at verses 1 and 2. We're talking about Herod's violence towards the church. Acts 12, 1. Now about the time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the early church... Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. First of the apostles to be martyred. And it's one of the inner circle of Jesus. If we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to really follow Jesus, you've got to be ready and willing to make sacrifices. Christianity is not a pastime where you sit on the sidelines and watch. You get in the game. And Jay is hardly waiting that I get done talking so he can check on the internet, see if his team's won. (laughs) He is. I can see. Never mind. If we're going to follow Jesus, first and foremost, you have to be willing to make sacrifices. Second, you have to be willing to serve. When the disciples hear what James and John have asked, they're a little bit miffed. How come those two get the special places? What's wrong with the rest of us, they think. Those of you who understand the term sibling rivalry, that's a pretty good description of what's going on in the dynamics of this small group. Jesus, as the good teacher he is, takes this opportunity to teach his disciples. And by the way, you and I are his disciples. We're just a couple centuries later. So what he's teaching in verses 42 through 45 apply to us as well. John chapter 10, verse 42. But Jesus called them to himself. And said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many." Look at verse 44 with me again. The Greek word we translate as slave literally refers to one who willingly gives up their rights 
for the betterment of somebody else. It's like that person you get real mad at in front of you who lets the person in from the side road. That's the slave. Someone who chooses to give up what is rightfully theirs for the betterment of somebody else. That's what we're talking about in verse 44. In God's kingdom, the greatest people are those who give up their rights and choose to be slaves to somebody else. I want you to remember what we read in these verses. Jesus gave up his life. It wasn't taken from him. Called down a legion of angels and wiped out the Roman army if he wanted to. He chose to give up his right to life for the betterment of us. He gave up his life willingly for a ransom. Not a term we use in our day-to-day -day activities a lot. The Greek means he gave that which is needed to set somebody else free. He gave up his right to serve others for their benefit so they could be free from enslavement to sin. Because of his willingness to serve, look with me in John chapter 8. I want you to be in John chapter 8. Land in verse 36. Because Jesus willingly gave up his right to life, we can read John chapter 8, verse 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen. Now, the inverse of that sentence is also true. If the Son of Man fails to make you free, you shall never be free. Those of us in Christ are no longer slaves to sin. Jesus extends his freedom to all who choose to be followers of him. So to really follow Jesus, we must be willing to make sacrifices. We must be willing to give up our rights and serve others for their benefit. And thirdly, you have to be willing to bring salvation to others. As I was writing the notes for the sermon this week, I got pictures from Stephen. I got texts from you all. The best recent example I know of, of willingness to bring salvation to others, is what you all did last Sabbath. Were you willing to make sacrifices? Yeah. Yeah. You could have gone home and done your lay activities. Some of you know what I mean. Are you willing to give up your rights to serve others? Yeah. And were you bringing salvation to others? Yeah. It's a long journey from the slime pit to the cross. It takes many steps to get there. Lots of people in the slime pit don't know how to get there. So you've got to help them take the first step out of the slime pit. You've got to help them figure out who Jesus is. You've got to understand what salvation is. You've got to understand what surrender is. You've got, to understand, you've got to do all that. It takes lots of steps. Which is why David and Jean shared with us that it takes about nine years to get some people out of the slime pit into the pews. We're not a patient people. What was wrong with today? Today would have been a good day. So, we have to make sacrifices. We've got to serve others, and we have to bring others to salvation. Back in Mark chapter 10, look with me at verse 46. 
They came to Jericho. And as Jesus went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude followed, and blind Bartimaeus, the son of somebody, sat on the road begging. Jericho is 18 miles northeast of Jerusalem. That's how I know Jesus and his followers are going southwest. Okay? And in the time of Jesus, there was in fact two cities. The first one that was built a while ago, and then this great beautiful winter palace that Herod built about a mile and a half away. So in a sense, there's two Jerichos, and the experts tell us that this miracle that we're about to read about occurred between the two cities, which explains the fact that Mark writes Jesus is leaving Jericho while Luke says he's approaching Jericho. They're referring to the two cities. He's in the middle of them. A large crowd is following Jesus. They're on their way to Jerusalem for the Passover a requirement for Jewish men to attend Jerusalem during the Passover. And a blind beggar hears Jesus coming. I suspect he hears the commotion of this crowd coming. Look at verse 47. And when he, the blind beggar, heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Son of David, have mercy on me. Unless you're real good at Jewish history, you won't understand Son of David. Jews knew the Messiah was going to come from the lineage of King David, so he had to be a son of David. People tell the beggar to be quiet. You're bugging us, kids. Shut up, sit down. They don't think Bartimaeus is worthy, because remember, physical ailments, so they thought, was a statement that you must have sin in your life and God is punishing you with physical ailments. So the fact you're blind tells us you're worthless anyways, leave us alone. Okay, that's the mindset of this crowd that's telling Bartimaeus, quiet, sit down, be quiet. Look at 49. So Jesus stood still. Talk about understatement. Doesn't argue, doesn't correct them, just stops walking. Jesus stands still and commands him to be called. Then they, the crowd, who are now a little bit, you know, chagrined because they made another mistake, they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. Because Bartimaeus believes Jesus can heal him, he quickly throws aside his coat, jumps up, and comes to Jesus. Now here's the point I want you to understand. This wasn't a happenstance. This wasn't like, oh, nothing else happening as I walk by. This was a divine appointment. Find Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 18. In that day, the day of the Messiah, the deaf shall hear the words of the book, and the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. You have divine appointments too. Now the question is, what are we going to do with them? I usually think they're just interruptions to my plan today. Leave me alone, i got things to do. Where's Marty? Is Marty still with us? If you were in Marty's Sabbath school class, he talks about the, our personal... Our, personality characteristic of we have a plan we're going to execute the plan don't get in my way I got something to get done and I can identify with that and yet there's always these divine appointments that mess up my day 
Jesus asks Bartimaeus what he wants him to do. Now, of course, Jesus knows what Bartimaeus wants him to do. Jesus is not asking to acquire information. He's giving Bartimaeus the opportunity to articulate his need and to declare his faith. Look at verse 51. And Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. Now we focus on the sight and we miss that word that starts with R. It's only used twice, by the way, in the New Testament. Here, and Mary Magdalene uses it to describe Jesus when he shows himself to her after his resurrection. This is an important word. It is an unequivocal personal form of rabbi, which is teacher. The Greek term we translate as rabboni means teacher, master, or lord. Bartimaeus uses this word on purpose because he wants a close personal relationship with Jesus. Here is an opportunity... For Jesus to stop his mission to Jerusalem and help a beggar get eternal life. If Jesus is our example, how can I ever be too busy to do the same? And that doesn't mean I have to give, you know, a 26 fundamental belief Bible study. At least not yet. Maybe all they need is for me to stop and let them come out the side road because traffic's too big. Following Jesus means following his example. Look at verse 52. Then Jesus says to Bartimaeus, go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. This isn't the first time that Jesus gave this command that your faith has made you well. The other time is in Mark 5, 34, if you care. Jesus doesn't want first century multitudes to think that he is a magician. That somehow through magic he can make things happen. He wants everyone, including Bartimaeus and the crowd, to understand that it was his faith that gave him his sight. Jesus is real critically concerned that the multitude of people understand that it's a faith-based relationship that is needed. The Greek word we translate as well in verse 52 is rendered as saved multitude of times throughout the New Testament. The implication is Bartimaeus is healed physically and he is saved spiritually. With Bartimaeus now saved, he follows Jesus on his final journey to Jerusalem. Now understand what's happening here at the end of chapter 10. Jesus has an appointment on the cross. It has to occur at a certain day to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. He knows all that. And yet, amongst all the pressure of what he knows is about to come, a group of disciples who don't even care what's about to happen, he stops and helps a blind beggar see and become saved. Seems like that's a pretty powerful example that you and I can't be too busy to do the same thing. Find John chapter 20. They moved John. Well, there it is. I want you to be in John chapter 20. Look with me at verse 21. 
John chapter 20, verse 21. Then Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Either you're engaged in the game or you're not following Jesus. I didn't say it, he did. Either you're involved in advancing the kingdom or you're not part of the team. First, century disciples were told to go. Nowhere in Scripture does it say it no longer applies. Amen. 21st century disciples are expected by Jesus to still be following him. Amen. To follow Jesus, which is what our Father in Heaven wants us to do, we have to be ready to sacrifice. We have to give up our rights for the betterment of others. We have to be willing to serve. We have to be willing to put their needs before our needs. Thirdly, you have to bring others to salvation. You have to do whatever it takes to help them meet Jesus. When you sacrifice, when you serve, and when you bring others to salvation, you'll be following Jesus in accordance with his expectations. Closing hymn is number 573. I'll go where you want me to go. It may 
Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you, Lord, that you've called us. We thank you, Lord, that you have equipped us. Now, Lord, help us to remember that you want us to sacrifice ourselves, to serve others, and bring them into a saving relationship with you. Is my prayer through Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>